Well, we have a counselor in our midst. And she's going to take us through ESTAR today. Michelle is the resident grief counselor for anyone who's dealing with FDA. Isn't that right, Michelle? That's right. Okay. I think that that's the more important service that I provide, you know, regulatory and qualities on the side of the grief. Have you had to take anyone in who was just weeping that you needed to console or put on the couch or anything? I don't know. It, if you... It's mainly anger. It's it's mainly anger that I'm talking them off the ledge from. Mm -hmm. I didn't write the regulations. You don't have to be mad at me or my team. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us about Easter today. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, fan favorite, Michelle Long. Okay. So the basics for some of you that might not have worked in the ESTAR, it's a P interactive PDF that the FDA has created to guide you through the preparation process for uh, 510K. It has, uh, it, it is an, it automatically constructs itself um, and it has these guided construction uh, instructions for each section and it has automatic verification built in as well. One important thing that you need to know is that your software and operating systems are very important. You have to have Adobe Acrobat Pro DC or the latest Acrobat uh, Pro, um, the Windows versions or Foxit. There are some known issues with uh, some known bugs in some of the, the other PDF programs. So the advantages of eStar for the FDA is that it enables more efficient and consistent reviews. It improves their product productivity. Um, and this last one's important because for all of these exorbitant um, user fees or uh, annual registration fees that industry has to pay, the FDA has to make commitments to um, usually improve their processes or some other initiative. And so this ESTAR program was a came out of a commitment for them to improve their pre-market review process. So this is now mandatory as of October 1 for all 510K submissions. They have to be submitted electronically using the ESTAR. Um, and then the de novo pre-submissions and PMAs are still voluntary. Uh, they released the templates for pre-submissions this summer. Um, there's, they were still in beta at the time. And then they just released the ones for PMAs this week. Michelle, just overall, do you think this change is good or bad? Real simple. That's a complicated answer, and we're going to, I did a SWAT on it. Okay. We'll get to here in a minute. Yeah, and I, I saw Rob snickering, so <laughs> he knows exactly where I'm going with this. So I think one of the interesting things is that, you know, the 510K process used to be a little bit more of a pull from the FDA if they uh, where it couldn't find something or thought your submission was missing certain testing, they would ask you the eStar template is intended to more pull that information from the manufacturer, um, requiring them to populate certain sections of the device uh, of the 510k based off of their design um, features. It is an interactive and dynamic format. Um, that is you select the different bubbles or check marks that apply for your submission and then it automatically either opens up or shuts down um, different uh, parts of the application. So it's, it's you have to streamline your supporting attachments. It helps to have the bookmarks or uh, for the table of contents. Um, you need to use smart naming conventions to facilitate finding the attachments. We recommend sequential numbering and a title that matches the attachment uh, description in the eStar. And the acceptable formats include PDF, Word, and Excel. And new in um, the eStar is that they, you can also attach videos. Um, which can be really helpful and wasn't an option before in um, normal PD, in, in the old way of assembling um, uh, 510Ks. 
So you need to review all the questions carefully because like I said, it will either, either open up or shut down different sections. This can be really tricky uh, if you're submitting a special 510K. You need to know which testing that you need to, to turn in to support your special 510K. Um, and it could negatively impact or slow down your submission if, it's in, if the incorrect information is presented or incomplete. So the template auto-populates text in other sections based on your response. Now, this is really interesting, and we're going to talk about this in more detail in the, the SWOT analysis. So in the device description section, or actually throughout the whole thing, any, in, any text box that has a yellow banner across the top is a, um, that, that information can be used to auto-populate the summary and it will be publicly available. So you need to be very careful about any text that you enter into these yellow boxes because um, you don't you wanna double check and make sure that there's not anything that you would consider a proprietary or confidential. So you have additional traceability information related to the guidance documents. And each section has a template now to uh, in the template to fill in the applicable guidance documents. This uh, didn't used to be a, necessarily a part of the 510K process, but now for every um, section, you need to in, enter the guidance documents that are uh, applicable to that section. So ensure that you attach all FDA correspondence directly to the E-STAR application, such as your 513Gs, pre-submissions, non-substantial equivalents, withdrawals, or your emergency use authorizations. So this can really make the template unwieldy in terms of size and attachments, especially if you have an NSE and you're trying to attach an entire previous submission to it. So get specific, the new requirements in the template, um, they, that you, they require you now for certain things, especially in labeling, to reference the specific attachment number and the page number within that attachment where that they can find this information. So some sections that are different is the ESAR template incorporates some forms which no longer need to be filled out because they are auto, they're built into the template itself. Um, so there is no longer the submission cover sheet or the indications for use form. Um, and the ESAR template has also excluded some previously re required forms like um, some, some things that just didn't make sense, especially after the FDA reclassified all class three devices, they're not, they're either now all PMA or they down classified to class two and they require 510K. So there's no more class th threes where 510K is an option. So they eliminated that form. They in eliminated the financial disclosure form and the declaration summary reports because those are now generated, the declaration summary reports are now generated by the E-STAR for you. So if we look at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of the, the E-STAR template and the 510K program now. So there's no refuse to accept anymore. Um, so in theory, that this means that you should start review 15 days earlier. Um, but so far, I haven't really seen much of a difference. It's still taken about two to three weeks for a reviewer to be assigned and to start that process. This does align with FDA's internal review template. So the E-STAR gets loaded into their internal system um, and it gets blown out into, uh, into their, their internal review where they make their notes and provide their AIs that they're gonna send you later. You get an error message if your responses don't make sense to it, which can be really helpful. Like if you indicate you have wireless technology, but you have um, not said that you include software, it will ask you questions like, how can you have wireless technology and you don't have, and you've indicated that you, your device doesn't contain software. 
um, the blue question marks, they have helpful links to pop-ups um, and that this can give, give you a lot of really um, specific information and instructions for that, that can be specific to your types of technology, including resources and hyperlinks directly to the FDA website to give you more context. So it, it has that, uh, that option to automate the 510K summary. You can check yes or no. And this is where I was talking about that it's really important to know what you're putting in those yellow boxes, because if you check yes, everything you put in those yellow boxes will be used to build the 510K summary. Um, and if you click no, then you're going to be asked to upload the 510K summary as an attachment later on. Personally, I still write them myself and upload them as an attachment. I choose not to um, have it auto-generated uh, for, for the public. And we'll take a look at what that looks like um, next. So this is uh, an example of what it looks like. And all of these fields are auto-populated directly from the eStar template. So even though you, you would have double checked it when you entered the information elsewhere, you need to also look at how did it pull over and how does it read in the context of the 510K summary. I actually came across one when I was doing a predicate search for a client recently where, um, the, and this is like the public 510K summary that's available on the 510K database for this particular um, device because they, they chose to have it auto-populated. Um, so again, you know, there might be some information that would not typically be uh, available to the public or that you may or may not include in your own, um, your own 510K summary in the way that it's presented here. Um, the format is also a little clunky and can kind of maybe be more difficult to read um, or make sense out of than, than the uh, self-prepared 510K summaries. Um, and then you can tell that this is auto-populated because it's the, some of it is the exact same format that it appears in the um, eStar template. So the pro here is that ideally it saves time by pulling this content so you don't have to draft this or uh, go in a back, back and forth with the reviewer about that they want this sentence to appear above the substantially equivalent table instead of below or they have all kinds of weird little feedback that they give you about those sometimes. Um, and then competitive insight. And this isn't a pro for, for you necessarily, but when you're reviewing um, you know, other predicates, you might be able to see uh, more information than you would otherwise see in um, a, uh, a summary that was prepared by the, the, the company. So, but... The con is you're unable to tailor exactly what information is going to be available in that public database and that, uh, again, you could be given uh, some competitive insight to another company that wants to use you as a predicate. Another strength is this automated completeness verification. So it will go through, um, initially, you'll, it'll start out as green, red, or um, gray. And so green um, means you're, it's good to go. Red means that something is missing and that should be there. And a gray is, a op is optional or it might be um, something where you haven't selected a feature yet where it hasn't either included or excluded the, correct, the, the particular contents. So another strength is that there's no more messing with standards and form, the standard forms. It auto-populates all the um, FDA recognized consensus standards from the, the database. So you can type, start typing in the number. It automatically fills in the um, name of the standard, the recognition number, um, and then you also tell it, how are you going to use it? Is it general use? or are you doing? Are you gonna do a declaration of conformity? Um, if you're gonna do a declaration of conformity, it will tell you, uh, it, it will create that declaration of conformity for you. Um, and the difference is, is when you do a declaration of conformity, it means that you have, um, re you've, you've fulfilled the standard in its entirety without um, any exemptions or deviations. 
Uh, whereas if you do general use, it means that you have um, used it again for general purposes and you haven't fulfilled the entire standard. It auto, it, once you put in the product code, the three letter product code, it also automatically pulls in all the information for the classification sections related to the medical specialty, the regulation number, um, and so on, and so on. But don't rely on this uh, solely um, to find, find, oh, this is, yeah, sorry. This is very helpful because it also populates if there is a product code um, that has a particular guidance document reference, it will bring in and populate the, um, a guide, the guidance um, information, which is really helpful because a lot of uh, companies may not realize that there is a guidance document applicable to their product code. And so the ESTAR will prompt you to make sure that not only do you include it as reference in your submission, but then you know that you should go back and um, make sure that all your, your testing, your labeling, et cetera, complies with that guidance document. Um, and But it won't pull in draft guidance documents um, you know, for obvious reasons, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't know that they're out there. You should still uh, look and be a, a aware because even draft guidance documents kind of reflect the industry, the FDA's current thinking on things. So even if you're not going to comply with them, you um, should at least be aware so that if you get an additional information request, you, you understand where it could be coming from. So weaknesses um, include file size um, and your processing of your submission might be delayed if your PDF exceeds one gigabyte in file size. Um, I haven't heard of anybody that hit it, but um, it, it, like you said, like I said before, you have to uh, attach all your previous communications. And if the the um, the submitter has had maybe an NSC and a couple of pre-submissions or more than one NSC, this file size can get large really quickly. Um, we the file count you need to combine attachments so that you only have one attachment um, provided to each question in ESTAR. And you need to really have a bookmarks and table of contents so the FDA can navigate that attachment. Make sure that you use the current version of the eStar template um, because this does change about every quarter or so, so far. Um, use the most updated versions of the, applica of the applications. There's a JavaScript bug in certain uh, Adobe Acrobat Pro applications that causes the dynamic PDFs like eStar to run slower than normal. Um, and this is directly from the FDA website. It says the slowness bug is not present in Foxit or any version of Adobe Acrobat Pro 2017 and for at least some, but not all users of Ac Adobe Acrobat Pro in DC. Um, so we are working with Adobe to help them resolve this bug. So this process is uh, still being worked out. This cracked me up when it came out. The FDA broke its own internet. So um, you're supposed to submit the eStar via the, um, the client communication portal and the portal won't accept all eStars. And so sometimes you still have to prepare these on a flash drive and mail them in to the document center. So the other weakness is that there are complications with the signatures. The truthful and accuracy statement must be assigned by the official correspondent editing the file. Um, and the official correspondent must be the one to finalize all signatures. But then sometimes that might this could be a concern working for uh, with other with consultants or when there are multiple people from the company that should be responsible for for signing. Um, and in practice, file collaboration um, happens all the time on 510Ks, but that's going to have, have to happen outside of eStar because eStar does not track changes. The file sharing of the eStar template itself is difficult. 
Um, and if you rely on iterative editing with a team or a client, um, the it using that solely the e-star template is complex and, and difficult. Weaknesses um, also include the limited space for in text sections. They, they require you to scroll. Um, there's no formatting that's supported and the content that is used to populate the 510K summary. So here's an example. You can tell it, like the device description is very lengthy section. And so all you get is like this text box that's four lines. So once you copy and paste, if say somebody makes a change later, you have to scroll and scroll and scroll. Also, if you are trying to collaborate directly in the eStar template and you're trying to read, you can't read more than four sentences at a time, which is kind of hard to keep the context of what you just read. So don't make, make sure you don't miss any um, required boxes. The biocompatibility section is a little tricky because you must click through each of the tests and either um, put in information relative to that test or put in a justification for why that test is unnecessary or wasn't chosen. Opportunities. What does this mean for the future of 510K in terms of global harmonization initiatives um, and standardization with other submissions? Health Canada just populated uh, or just did a, pi a pilot with the E-Star. Um, and from what I hear from my Canadian friends, it was, uh, it was quite clunky. Um, what does, and then what does this harmonization plan look like beyond E-Star? Uh, you know, all these other geographies that where they're considering the pilot of the E-Star have totally different classifications to the system. So how is all that going to work out and be integrated? Um, we, uh, the pre-submissions were released in beta on, uh, in June this year. The PMA was uh, released on Wednesday. And other Q submissions like the 513Gs, we anticipate to roll out over the next year. Threat Threats is that the template crashes, which happens a lot. You need to save early and often, um, which also takes a lot of time. So uh, some, and then a threat is also someone in your organization made a change. There's no track changes, so you're not gonna know that A, it changed, or B, know what or where to go to review the change. Um, there's a lot of wasted time because you're gonna spend a lot of time uh, waiting in front of your computer for Adobe to respond, or Adobe to save, or to upload an attachment. Um, and the threat is mainly to your mental health during this whole process. It'll make you a little crazy. So to recap, your strengths include uh, no RTA review. And I, I, I say all these are hypothetical. Alignment with the internal FDA review templates, guidance on uh, document integration, automation of the 510K summary, completion verification, and no more standard forms. St recognize consensus standard forms like declarations of conformity. Weaknesses include the challenges with the file size, count, and versions, bugs in the software apps, the, the difficulty of managing signatures, no file collaboration, and limited text se sections for visibility. Opportunities is that it uh, is an opportunity for a streamlined global harmonization initiative for submissions and ex expansion to other submission types. Threats or the template crashes, wasted time, and your mental health. So the reviews are in. These are when I was preparing this and I was talking to some different uh, colleagues that uh, have used it since it first came out well before it was uh, required. It's a pain. It has little ability to tell a story or cross-reference sections. The redundant info is just clunky. And if you modify a further section, you have to go back and redo a previous section. It looks like they've been complaining since the 1970s with this slide. <laughs> it's, uh, it's vintage, mm -hmm. just much like the software programming that, that's behind it. Good one. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but a lot of people really, really love it and thinks it, and thought it improves their process. But the people um, who said that weren't really relying on other team members for collaboration either. So I think that that has a lot to do with where you're at on the love or, or um, hate. So this is new to everybody, even the FDA. So there is still a learning curve um, and we are for sure putting all the electronic systems and interfaces through their, their paces right now, as we see by them breaking their own systems. Um, there is no FDA specific trainings on the CDH Learn Portal, which I thought was fascinating for them to make this mandatory in October and they don't have a uh, FDA provided training. They do have FAQs. And one of the most helpful things that I've seen was a REMSYS E-STAR uh, submissions uh, training where the FDA were the guest speakers. There were two people from the FDA and, that, and it was very helpful and very informative. So to optimize the process, your steps to success are going to start with the downloading the current eStar form from the FDA. And bless your heart, if you started uh, compiling your eStar and then um, they changed the template halfway through right before you were ready to submit. Um, populate the required sections. Note the color coordination. Your red required, your green is optional, um, required or optional to complete and your gray is also optional. Um, and then you, you can submit when your status bar says, turns green and says it's complete. So the secrets to, to be successful with those steps um, is that we recommend preparing the, uh, the Word document for your team collaboration. And then once you get the finalization, copy and paste it into the eStar or attach it, um, put it in, upload it as attachment. Utilize the instructional and help text where applicable. Do not include in confidential information uh, in the text boxes that are uh, with the yellow banners at the top. Use smart naming conventions to facilitate finding attachments. Um, and then save the templates after every change or every attachment that you upload um, to prevent uh, loss of data if it preliminary crashes. So use the verification section at the end of the template to see what's missing. Um, and don't forget to go back and complete all the sections and look for that green status bar that it's complete and ready for upload. Upload it to the CCP or the customer collaboration pro program uh, pro portal. Um, the requirements are that you have a signed cover letter attachment within the lead eStar template. You have the eStar template in all the files, and then you upload it to CCP and you press send, um, unless it doesn't take it, and then you put it on your flash drive and mail it in. So how do you process additional information requests now? Well, option one is that you can continue to submit them in the e-copy format, um, or you can also use the eStar template and instead of, um, you would still select pre-market notification instead of new application, you'll select additional information. So here's some helpful links if you wanna go back and verify um, all of this later or, or you, you need to reference um, some of this information or the, the FAQs. Okay. Eugene and David, you had some comments, and Rob is already working the Q and A there with an answer or two. Rob, you want to for the rest of the class? Sure. There were three questions. First question was, "What happens when it crashes? Do you lose everything?" Yes. Since the last save, you lose everything to that point. I feel your pain, Michelle. <laughs> yeah. Um, especially at hotels. You have poor internet connection. You're trying to download. You have a lot of screens open. You're on your laptop. It's an older laptop. Yeah, you lost everything. And you control. And that's when you cry and go grab a, a drink at the bar and come back and, and go back to work. And you control that. It's like you're doing Microsoft products. Um, you can't. You're lo you lose everything. It will not save as you go automatically. You have to click save. Mm -hmm. No other option. Um, 
the second question was, can you convert it to a Word doc and then fill it in? No. Um, you can create a Word document, like Michelle said, for each of the sections that you're going to have to do, and then copy and paste that information in. If that's how I was going to proceed, I'd probably use something more like um, Google Drive um, and have it be an informal document because you're not going to actually submit the Google document. You're not going to submit the Word document. You're going to submit the PDF uh, ESAR. So I just caught once I, everybody agrees it's done, then it's copy this to page two, copy this to page five. So you, you're copying and pasting as you go. Um, there was other another question, the one gigabyte file size limit, um, is that including the video? The one gigabyte file size is for the one eStar you're submitting, which includes all the attachments. And one of those attachments will be any videos that you have. So if you attach five different videos, each one is a big video, you're going to blow right through that um, 100 gigabyte. So you're not going to submit large videos. You're going to submit very small videos. You're not going to submit your entire clinical study, all the imaging data in every single slice of every single DICOM. If you've got something like that, you get to submit an, an e-copy or you've got to mail something or something like that. So there, there are, are some workarounds. There are a lot of compression tools online that I encourage you to just Google before. Yeah. You... Yep. And we we use those, but um, I haven't run over the limit yet on any submission that we've done, but I've seen clients give me stuff that I knew was going to go over the limit and I had to compress it. Andre, you have your hand raised. Trying to be uh, very formal for you, Joe. I see that. People are typing today. I don't know what's going on. Uh, so, Michelle, great presentation. I th thought it was very well done. Got a question for you. For example, if you don't check off, let's say, biocompatibility, um, and will it, will it be rejected at the E-Star point, or will we get an RAI for that? Um, well, biocompatibility is one of the, uh, the weird sections where it kind of makes you go through and provide justifications um, for it. Uh, so, but, and then, like I said, for the other ones, it kind of self checks itself based off of your technology features. And it kind of knows like, okay, like I said, if they have, they, they said that they have Bluetooth, but they didn't say they had software. It kind of will put those, those together for you, but you, you can still get um, AIs for missing information. Okay. So, uh, is it, so uh, do you think there'll be more things like the rejections of the RTA? Uh, you know, when the, when the forms weren't properly filled out or checked off, will there be more of that or less of that because of this? There's a, so theoretically supposed to be less of it. Okay. It's not technically called an RTA anymore. Now it's called a technical review. And that specific problem you mentioned didn't include biocompatibility and you should have. That should be caught in a technical hold. And so it's the same 15 days. They reset the clock to zero. But um, technical holds do appear to seem do appear to happen less frequently, simply because the e star validates itself. So a lot of the rookie mistakes don't happen. But for Michelle and I, we probably have the same number of technical holds as we would have had RTAs because we don't get many in the first place. Michelle Mitchell. So, so Joe, <laughs> David. So I I heard uh... David, you're cutting the line. What? You're cutting. How rude. Everyone else was so polite. They raised their hands. I'm, they've been typing. Sorry, I know. I was going to comment on, on this discussion at the moment. Sorry, Michelle, I think. Um, okay. Well, indulge. Edmar Jerson, FDA, I think, is who I heard say, you can fill a field with garbage and it will pass the automatic RTA, but you're going to get stuck. So, you know, they really expect we're properly following templates, providing the information they need. Um, there will be technical holds or RTAs pop popping up the more broadly this is used. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've been typing. Now I'm going to go back to typing. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, and if you answer some of those questions wrong about your technology, it's not going to open certain sections for you to complete at all. And then, you know, that might also cause, uh, cause, you, cause you issues. Ms. Mitchell. Michelle? Okay. Yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Michelle, for this wonderful presentation. And thank you, Rob, for answering some of the questions. Um, I facilitate two fighting case for uh, a manufacturer in Taiwan uh, because 
I just don't think I'm able to do this 510K on my own. So I hire a, a consultant because there are a lot of consultants out there. You provide them your technical files and all your test reports, and they will bundle it up to do that for you, but they are quite expensive. So with this e-submission, um, now it's kind of enforced. Uh, are still people out there can do that for you or we have to do it on our own now? Now, the, you're, the, the same consultant should be able to do it for you. I know Rob and I both prepare the e-stars for our clients after okay. our clients have given us the testing and other relevant documentation. Okay, so the, the consultant, we um, help us shape her through this process for those two 510 case. I think he's at the place that he, he wanted to retire. So uh, the manufacturer is working on the third device. Uh, I think it's still at least a year or two before they can get everything together, including the 60601, six, 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 um, those safety and essential requirement testing done. So when they are done, can I reach out to you you know, to help us do that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. So that, that's good to know. Thank you. Thank you. Susie? Not that button, Susie. You lowered your hand and kept yourself silent. Sorry, my bad. Um, okay. First of all, thank you. That was really informative, Michelle and Nellie. And, and I plan on working with you guys next year when we get ready to go to Europe. So we're preparing right now to submit to a 510K. And what if our um, human factor videos are, are too large? That's my first question. And so how do we navigate the, the system? And my second question is how does this affect Europe and, and submitting to Europe? I'd like to suggest something that you could probably um, at least one and a half times, if not two times the speed of your video to shorten it. Well, like Rob said in the chat, normally you don't turn in human factors videos in a submission. And, and you know, having videos at all is a new thing. So there is no, I think, expectation from the FDA that you have a video. It's just like a nicety now. Michelle, I wonder if you were to upload a video to something like a mega NZ or private YouTube and you just, okay, Rob has gesticulated the answer. They won't yeah, click on something. We tried, the FDA said internally, their IT system will not allow them for security reasons to access external sites. Nice. So just basically the data that you 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 came up with from the videos is submitted? Yep. Yes, that, that's what you submit. I, I have, where things are hard to understand, um, where you've got a, a very complicated sequence of manual actions the person has to perform i've provided a short video of that step so they can see what we're asking the person to do in the human factors but if if you have 15 people performing it i don't send them 15 videos of it and the human factors sessions might be an hour or more long that's a lot of video when you're only trying to show 15 seconds of tasks and i like joe's idea of speed it up that's a, that's a good idea to show them what they want to see without showing them everything at slow speed. Thanks. Michael? Oh, I'm sorry. The second part of Sue's question is yeah. uh, this, this has no bearing on Europe. Totally unrelated. Michael? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> is there any automated pass-through from maybe a pre-sub over to like the 510K or the de novo? No. Um, no economies of scale of using the system across two different submissions. No, they're, they're, that's oh. not capability yet. And any any trends of this actually changing duration of of processing? They again, you know, I, I gave the caveat that all the advantages are theoretical. That mm -hmm. is supposedly one of the theoretical advantages is that it will make the review process more standardized and a little less like where's Waldo. But um, so far, I have not seen any difference in turnaround times. Have you, Rob? Um, the only person on our team that I've seen get faster turnaround times is Wandy. He's our youngest and least experienced, <laughs> ironically. 
but I think we have to give credit to the fact that he was working on the simplest devices we've ever submitted. So I have a feeling that might have been the reason, but he did get a 52 day turnaround. Wow. Yeah, I'm jealous. He said wow. he's had four submissions and three interactives. It's kicking my butt. Wow. <laughs> so we gave him some harder projects now. So we'll see how he does. <laughs> You gotta, you gotta equalize the playing field. Exactly. You, you gave him an easy start. He, he got sucked in. Now we're gonna kill him. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, for this presentation. I, I normally don't. Uh, I'm not involved in five ten case, but I sometimes have clients with questions and. Um, um, yeah, I now know that I need to have a local expert, and I, I know some. Um, and uh, but vice versa, if you want to come to Europe, um, start as early as possible and reach out to someone with good experience there. And um, I mean, I, I heard Sue say something about that. Like going next year? No, no, no. Now, because it will take a lot of time to get there. Fifty-two days. That may be the time, if you're lucky, that you get an answer from your first email that you send to a notified body. Uh, that's if you're lucky, right? So no, um, you, you need to, you're going to need time in in Europe, and um, and you need to be efficient, and uh, so and get a good a good consultant to help you with that. That's my advice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ronald. Rick, you had a written question. But you guys answered. Uh, you guys answered all my questions at, um, about the alternative. Of course, is manual submission, and I started looking at this. And I've got some computer processes and some experts that I hire to guide me through that stuff. And it sounds like you're doing that for your clients, which has got to be an enormous relief because they're probably concentrating on everything else at once. So you answered all my questions. Yep. There were a lot of written things. Rob, there other things. I that, love Rob's comment written. where he said that. Um, that one client wanted to do the e star themselves, and they still had to pay Rob several uh, several hours worth to help them debug the the e star submission. Honestly, that particular person, it was her first five ten k, and she did the best job I've ever seen for a first timer. But it still took two hours to debug. Um, and I don't know how the submission's going; it's in review, <laughs> so we'll see what the AI looks like. But yeah, it. Um, we have a client that's done. They've gotten five or six 510Ks so far, um, all with our help. And this is the first time they've submitted with the E-Star because they didn't want to submit with the E-Star the last two times this year. And we were like, we do this all the time. And like, no, 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 we want to do the old way. So now that they had no choice, they were struggling on how do we sign the declaration of conformity? How do we upload it to the CCP? And I said, if you would just let me show you how, let me sh have you share your screen and I'll walk you through it and we'll record it, you'll learn each of the steps and you'll know exactly how to do it. And after we walked them through it, it took like 15, 20 minutes. They were like, oh, this is so easy. I'm like, it's just somebody showing you the ropes. <laughs> I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, it reminds me like, uh, if you if you don't, if you've never had a car that had a fob, knowing how to turn on the car might be a challenge. <laughs> and that's sort of what this is like. It's somebody showing you the ropes on how to sign it. Once you've done it once, it's not hard. Mm -hmm. um, it, do, it doesn't require a PhD. It, re, it requires somebody that can read and understand. And I saw that you wrote in the comments that on average, you're needing to invest 50 to 60 hours to help a client on this. Yeah, and, and um, that's assuming that we're not writing protocols and it's not including pre-subs with the FDA. It's assuming we're not writing the device description for them or their instruction for use. For perspective, how many hours would you have typically needed to offer a client to help them before this? It's about a wash, about 50 to 60 before. So it's just trading different things. We, we, we're we dealing with a really slow e-star in Adobe, but it automates a lot of tasks for us. So it's about a wash. So I wouldn't say it made it harder, um, but I would say for the reviewer, it's probably night and day difference because everything's the same format for every single submission. So I would hope that the, the turnaround times at the FDA will improve or at least the variability from slow to fast will get a lot narrower. Thank you. Michelle again? Yes, um, it's an unrelated question because um, the manufacturer uh, I was working, well, I'm still working with that they are due for the MD set 
renew. So is FDA still encourage the MD set program or is kind of up to the manufacturer? They they are still participating in the in the SAP, but um it is it is optional and it will probably always be voluntary. And so the way the way it works is that if you are selling into a country, when you get your MDSAP audit, you have to include the countries that you're selling into. It's not like optional. And then they turn in the report to the FDA directly. Then the FDA reviews the report and determines if they concur or not. But and it it does not you they still might get a four cause inspection it doesn't necessarily mean that the fda is not going to come yeah I, I went through a fda audit with them um right before covid so it, it was the scariest thing i ever had to do so um and by the way um you use the acronym ccp is very just pop up to to my head uh usually when we mention ccp that's a chinese communist party so so i don't know why <laughs> It's good to know. It, it, it might feel the same to some people. Um, customer, <laughs> customer communication portal. Customer communication portal. Thank you. Eddie? Yeah. Hi, Michelle. Uh, as a great presentation. I am not this tech savvy, but from what you were describing, has anybody thought about or have the capability to just do like screen scrapes of each of these things to convert it into a single document where you could Again, work with it collaboratively offline with people in a Google Docs type environment. I don't know that that's really net well, and it's not very functional again because of the scrolling that you have to do, where you can only see four lines of text. It's just yeah. easier to just work in the old-fashioned Word yeah. or Google Doc. Yeah. Anyway, it, it, I'm looking forward to working on this with you and your team. <laughs> That's our next thing. Yeah. And as just a and small little. And that it's my problem and not yours. <laughs> and as a small little advertisement, again, Ronald, to the whole group, thank you so much for all your help recently. We just did a submission here in Europe. Everyone, please pray for us to whatever spaghetti God you bow to. Uh, and Joe, thank you very much for putting me in touch with both Michelle and Ronald. Look at my little community that makes Joey so happy. Okay. Um, Luke is on his bicycle and he writes, if risking omitting is a serious issue, is it advisable to add an index file like a QMS survey of documents? I don't know that I understand that question. Rob, did you... Um, I think the question is, they're trying to understand what it is, and they're saying, is it like an index, like we have a tech file index or a DMR index? And I would say it's not an index. Um, it is, um, it's a form that you have to fill in and you have to attach the documents, whereas an index would just list the documents and wouldn't have the attachments. Um, and this also asks you to explain things and tell you what page number things can be found on. So the half of the document is literally the FDA reviewer's checklist. So they don't have to do as much work. Uh, Luke, if you like, I, I opened your mic, even though you don't want to come on camera today, if you want to add anything. In the meanwhile, David. Yeah, um, I know the uh pma e star was just released but is the capability for data 10 times bigger 20 times bigger i mean the files that's can a be great question and i have not looked at that template yet but you would think that there it had to have a, a larger size limit yeah i would but it's also probably the same platform and right who knows yeah Thanks. Joanna, this is your first time joining us, so I'll ask you to first introduce yourself. Yes, hello. Uh, so I'm working in the medical device company in the regulatory affairs team, and uh, we are working as, among others, we're preparing the 510K submission for our devices. It's uh, electrocardiograph uh, devices like Holter or other monitoring device, and also a software device for uh, 
AI, uh, AI algorithms for analysis of the ECG signal and also the platform for ECG technician or meds uh, or healthcare professional to to prepare the reports uh, with analyzed ECG signal. And uh, uh, my question is uh, today, like we sent the a copy submission a uh, few months ago before before 1st October and already received some additional information request. And now we are preparing the answer for the FDA. And what are the your recommendation regarding the answer to, uh, to FDA? It's rather should be a copy or ESTAR. And in case it would be ESTAR, uh, should we also attach uh, the documents which are unchanged so, uh, to which FDA didn't have any any comments and if no it seems like the ESTAR becomes incomplete. Yeah. Are you telling us from Borshawa right now? What? I'm asking Joanna if she's calling in from Warsaw, Poland right now. Yeah. Yes, from uh, I'm working from Warsaw but today I'm in Wrocław, uh, it's other city in Poland. Thank you. Michelle? I have not used the ESTAR for additional information. Um, I've been, um, I, I've just used the normal e-copy or interactive review. Um, if I, I don't see, that seems unreasonable that they would expect you to attach everything from the first 510K and that kind of defeats the purpose of the additional information concept is to address just those you know, gaps where they, they had questions. Rob, have you used the additional information at ESAR? We have um, many, many times. Um, in fact, I think everybody on my team has done it now, including Wandy. Um, I actually asked this question, the first one I did to Patrick Axel, who wrote the one for the non-IVD version. And his response was that, um, and, and he actually involved the reviewer, because I had the reviewer in the same email chain, because it was an active review. They uh, both agreed that the um, e-copy was easier for us to respond with than the e-star AI response. However, um, they said they would prefer that we respond with the AI um, e-star because it kept everything in one file instead of splitting it up. And it, it helped organize things. Um, after seeing how they've responded to AIs with the E-Star, I'm not sure I agree with that statement. <laughs> I don't think it's helped them organizationally at all. Um, but we have really well-organized AI responses that we do in e-copy. So I don't think there's a lot of difference between the two. I, I agree with Michelle's statement of we never provide everything again in an e-copy. We only provide the new documents um, we do provide an updated table of contents. So it says, this is what we've provided that's new. And this is what we've changed. That's new versions. Um, and I could see now that everybody's doing ESARs, it could get more challenging to say, you know, I deleted the old one. I deleted the old one and I replaced it with the new device description, let's say, or I, I deleted the substantial equivalence table and I attached a new one is what they want you to do for the AI. They want you to just take your original submission, change, select AI instead of selecting, um, instead of uh, starting with a brand new one. And they want you to go in there and replace documents that need to be replaced and add new documents where they need to be added at the very end in the AI section. Um, so it takes a little bit of practice to, to keep it all organized. But I, at the end of the day, I think the fastest way is to do the e-copy and only provide the documents that are new. And the AI response with the um, e-star is the harder way to submit it. So that, so that answers the question I think that you were asking, but there is a consequence to which choice you make. Um, you Most companies wanna keep a copy of what the final submission was that got cleared. And if you have an e-star here and you have an e-copy here, you need sort of a, a Word document that tells you what parts of each you're keeping and what parts you're not keeping. Um, so you kind of need that table of contents to say, 
all the original documents in the e-star except this one this one this one this one and all the documents from this e-copy and if you have more than one e-copy it gets even worse whereas if you had used the ai response then it would be very easy to say this final version of the ai e-star is exactly what the final submission is and so that's what i would prefer to do to say this is my final submission but um both options are available both options are allowed the fda from this one reviewer and patrick said we would prefer you use the ai e-star but you're not prevented from using the e-copy at all okay thank you it's answered my my question and concerns i'll quickly uh read um something from the camera shy anu singh who writes also for a response to an additional response FDA now provides the date and time to respond by in the letter, but if your due date falls on a public holiday, then you need to get it in before the holiday, i.e. 4 p.m. on the previous day that FDA was working as though it were mailed. So I hope that's helpful. And then um, Sarudin asks, can we submit a few devices into one submission of eStar? A, a few? Yes. Can you do more than one device on a submission? Just like you, within the same scope that you used to be able to in um, the normal 510K process, there has to be, you know, maybe variations or different kit configurations or components or accessories that are being sold together. You know, they can't be unrelated or have different features, different intended users or different technological features. Thank you. I think I've addressed everything that's written. If not, raise your hand or something. And uh, Michelle, where, by the way, are you? Um, are you calling in from? You are on mute. Yeah, I live in Florida. Um, my space post, and I, I was working in IT for twenty eight years, but I switched to medical device um, about ten years ago. Um, can I have? I know we are past twelve o'clock, but can I just have really? A small mm -hmm. comment and a one quick question. Of course, go ahead. Okay, since we're talking about FDA, um, and also I realize on the call there are some folks are from EU or from other than the US. So I'm just wondering, um, for the people from EU, what do you think of MDR? And also, Joe, is it possible that we can have somebody willing to talk about MDR a little bit in the future? Michelle, do you know anyone who knows MDR? Do you talk about that at all? I've, I've met somebody. Yeah? Yeah. She, you know a gal? Yeah. Uh, Michelle uh, Mitchell, um, Michelle Watt has spoken on this topic many times, and they are in our archive, which I will put uh, a link to in the chat. And uh, the right. other thing I'll put in the chat is um, in your presentation, uh, Michelle, you had a uh, a gif of Rowan Atkinson, uh, which not only amused me, but reminded me of um, a skit that he did. And I'm going to share that link with everyone because it amuses me a great deal. Uh, but first, uh, Michelle, here is the, uh, the link to all of the uh, previous episodes, some 200 and Five, I think, at this point. So I haven't cried. Michelle Ronald Ronald um here he did one recently as well. On okay. Yeah. yeah because, if, um, if I have any more children, I have to name them Ronald Michelle. Yeah. He's that helpful. He doesn't know. Okay. okay. Yeah, because um we have a we have two class two A um doc, I mean devices in the EU, and we are using the legacy MDD because the certificate would not expire to next year. So we already uh, work with TUV and trying to get a contract so that way we can still sell the devices under the legacy cloth because there's no risk involved. So, but it's very painful trying to get from MDD to MDR. If class one is not too bad, but class two A is a little, little more. And um, so that's why if, you know, some experts can get on and just share their expertise, I think that would be very helpful. Importantly, before you all sign off, go to the chat and copy paste that link to this most amusing five minutes. 
um, uh, Morty. Praise everybody from Morty. The other dogs are are not big into hot chocolate, or uh, they are not such a ham like Morty is. Like he's he's a poser. Huh. I brought my cat today. Oh, <laughs> what's that? Her name is Spaz. She's 16 years old and on her last legs, trying uh -huh. to stay warm with her sweater on. How long have you had her? All 16 of those years? Uh, it, Tiffany has had her for all 16 years, yes. Okay. Well, our warm thoughts with Spaz. Uh, thanks She's to cold North. up here in the north. Yeah, well, you chose to live there. I don't know what else to say to that. Well, it's going to be 58 here. I don't know. If That's you're going to be able to get through that? Yeah, I don't so I got my vest on today in my heater. Um, we haven't run over in a while. That only goes to say how uh, important and relevant this topic was. Uh, it's also the most people who have logged on and asked questions in many, many months. So, Michelle Lott, you, you bring the, the goods. We appreciate it. Uh, next week will be our last for the year, uh, as I typically relieve you all for the holidays and uh, New Year's. Um, Dr. David Kay is a physician entrepreneur, a successful one, and he's going to talk about what it's like to sell into hospitals from a physician's standpoint. So I think you will find that interesting. And for Joe Hage and Joe Hage Enterprises, this has been Joe Hage, along with Michelle Lott. Thanks to Rob, and thanks to you all for being part of my little family. See you next week. Bye.